great opportunity a few weeks to get involved with that ministry. I have great news for us this morning, church family. You ready for this? You are part of God's eternal miracle. I haven't overstated it. I haven't exaggerated, but just turn to your neighbor, and I want you to soak on that a little bit. Say to your neighbor, we are part of God's eternal miracle. Believe it, and let me uh, just encourage you as to why it's true. You thought you came this morning just to maybe, you know, have your spiritual uh, tank charged up a little bit, enjoy some good food, see some friends, but on a much grander level, we are all part here at New Hope Kailua of God's eternal miracle. We were founded as a miracle. We weren't founded 12 years ago. We were founded about 2,000 years ago by the most miraculous person who ever came into history, and yes, Previous to Jesus Christ, God had done some miracles in human history, but nothing like the person of Jesus. God the Son came into our world, the greatest miracle of all. He was born of a virgin. That had never happened before. He grew up and he did all sorts of miracles, interventions of God. He uh, fed people from thousands of people from a sack lunch. He created matter. He... um, healed blind men and and raised people who were lame and and drew Lazarus out of the tomb of death and in his greatest miracle he went to the cross to suffer for your sins and mine but he rose from the dead and he broke the power of sin and death and hell the greatest miracle of all and it didn't end there he is the miracle worker who founded his church and New Hope Kailua is just a part of that and you and I are part of that as followers of Jesus as members of his church. He gave the gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and in a miracle he gave birth to a new community, a new people of God, a new family. And over these last few weeks we've seen that that one of the amazing things about being part of the church is it's God's new creation community. Revelation 21-22 says that When Jesus Christ returns, he's going to create a new creation, a new heavens, a new earth. He's going to do away with all suffering, with all sin, with all evil, with all pain, and everything will be made new and beautiful. He's going to make things right in the universe. Jesus himself was the first fruits of that new creation. That's what Paul calls him, the Holy Spirit calls him in the book of 1 Corinthians. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead... He received a resurrection body, and he is the first fruits of the new creation. But it's not just Jesus in his resurrection. It's, guess what? You and me. We are part of God's future here and now. As individual believers, we're a new creation in Christ, and the church is described as God's new creation. It's a start of what he's going to do ultimately in the whole universe in the future. And so he's made you and me right with God. He's justified us. He's made us right with God here and now as a foretaste of him making the whole universe right. And he wants to be at work in our lives as those who are made right with God to help make the world right now. And that means helping other people come into this relationship with God and them being new creations. It's a mind-boggling reality that the church and our lives is... In one sense, a foretaste of the future, it's God's work in the future entering into human history here and now. Now, we've seen that that has huge implications on our relationships because we're called to be God's new community. It's a miraculous community. It will extend for eternity. We all get to be a part of that. But we've seen one of the key uh, characteristic elements, descriptions, the DNA of the church, if you will, is family. One of the key truths about this new creation community is God has created us to be family. And that's the first part of your notes this morning. I want us to pull out your notes and see together that God has designed this eternal miracle community to be family. Now, most of us knew that, but my uh, challenge to you this morning and to myself, to us as a church family, is um, to see this in perhaps a deeper way to let it sink into our hearts and our lives in a deeper way. What does it mean to be family? If God himself has created this new creation community, this foretaste of of his eternal work in the whole universe, what does that mean for us here and now? And how do I enter into that in a deeper level? Family is at the center of it. And so God has designed his church, this new creation community, to be family. Scripture says this, and by the way, this is my mission this morning, to help us see this from the scriptures 
and to recognize that all of us are in a different place in our journey of experiencing God's people as family. Some of us know this fairly deeply and have walked it and, and we want to even walk it more deeply in September with our new series. Some of us, it may be a new thing for us to look at what it means to experience family. And, and we're going to see small groups is a key part of this. It's a vital part of it. It's not a church program. It's a vital part of God's purpose for us to experience his community as family. But the scriptures teach us, and I've just given you one verse where Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2. That is why you Gentiles, you non-Jewish people, you're no longer foreigners. You're no longer outside the covenants with God. But now you are, catch this, he says two things. You are citizens together with God's people and members of God's family. Think about those images. A citizen is a political image because you are a citizen of a country or a citizen of a kingdom. And what he's saying is God's rule has broken into history in a new and a powerful way and God's kingdom is no longer now the kingdom of Israel, the country of Israel. Now it's Jesus as king over the church, Jesus as leader and rightful resurrected king over this new community, this creation community, and whether you're Jew or Gentile, you come into this new humanity, this new people of God. You're a citizen of a new kingdom, and Jesus is the king. But that's sort of a political image. It's more personal to that. He says you're part of this kingdom, but you are also members of God's family. It's very personal. You have a new heavenly father. You have brothers and sisters in Christ. You have deep bonds. What is a family? A family is affection and commitment and bonds and being known. You're known by your family and your family knows you. And he's saying, this is God's design for his new humanity to be family, commitment, care, relationships. All of that is embodied in this idea of family. Now, in one sense, it shouldn't surprise us because when you step back and you look at the scriptures, God is the God of relationships. He's the God of family. Shouldn't surprise us that he created the church to be family. He himself exists in relationships. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in some way that's way beyond our understanding and our intellect, the living one God of the universe, three persons, one God, but he exists in relationships. And when he created people on earth to image himself on earth, he created them in relationships. Male, female, gave them the gift of, of procreation of children. He created the nuclear family, what we know as the family. That came from the heart of God. It's a reflection of who he is. And when he had to intervene in human history because the wheels fell off through sin and death, and, and he said, I'm going to start my process on earth in history to bring life to all the peoples of the earth. What did he do? He chose a family. He chose Abraham and his family and his son, Isaac, and his son, gr grandson. And, and through that family, he said, I'm going to enter into, in essence, a family relationship, a covenant. What's a covenant? Commitment and affection. That's at the heart of what a family is. I'm going to create a family on earth the nation of Israel, and through that I'm going to bring life to all the peoples of the earth. He's the God of the family. So it shouldn't surprise us that when he creates the church, it's a family. And he says, this is my new people, my new humanity. This is a foretaste of, of me making everything right in the universe. I'm going to make things right with people right now. I'm going to create this new family. And it's about relationships and caring and commitment to one another. And so the church is designed to be family. And one of the ways in which um, God wants, the, the best way to experience family is in small groups. That's why we're encouraging, building, seeking to strengthen, encourage everyone to be involved in a small group. It's not a church program. It's not something that people thought up to say, how can we do church better or more effectively? Or No, this is built into God's purpose for the church. And you see it in Acts chapter 2, and we've seen this passage, that when the miraculous church was given birth on the day of Pentecost, when, when God poured out his Holy Spirit and, and brought this new community together, they met together in the temple as one big family. But all of God's purposes couldn't happen in that one big gathering, so they met together in small groups in homes where relationships and care and ministry happened together. And that dynamic was birthed into the birth of the church. And that's why it's a part of our ministry here at New Hope Kailua. And, and again, if this is new to you, 
I want to say to you that God has some wonderfully good gifts to give to you. And it's going to happen through the ministry of small groups. You may not realize that, but Jesus taught that God the Father, the living God of the universe, is like a loving father who delights to give his children good gifts. There are good gifts he wants to give you, but here's the thing. You're going to have to unwrap those gifts. <laughs> You're going to have to take action to experience that good gift. You're going to have to cash in, if you will, on that good gift. thought about it this last week, and um, you know what? Uh, I carry in my wallet, I think I've got three, maybe four, gift cards. <laughs> Do you carry gift cards in your wallet? I was given those gift cards months ago. Months ago, and I just carry them out. I haven't cashed them in yet. Somebody wanted to bless me, but I haven't received that blessing yet. I've just, I just carry them around. I think there are some of us who, maybe even unwittingly, God has given us gift cards, <laughs> but we haven't cashed them yet. We haven't experienced the benefit of them yet. We're just carrying them around, and we've heard about it, and other people talk about it, but we haven't experienced that. And my desire, my heart for you this morning is that you would cash in on the good gifts that God has deposited into your life or wants to deposit, but you're going to have to take some action to receive the benefit of that good gift. So I'm going to share with you this morning from the scriptures how the ministry of small groups will bring God's gifts into your lives in deeper ways, into all of our lives in deeper ways. There are some gifts that we will never experience that God wants to give us unless we're involved in deep and meaningful and authentic and close relationships, and that's what small groups are all about. But before we do that, I want to look at some blessing busters, because here's what I've learned over the years. There are some things that um, for people to step into a small group, there are a number of barriers that keep people apart from that experience. And uh, I've learned over the years to encourage folks, wherever they're at, to take a step over those barriers, to overcome the blessing busters. What are they? Well, I can think of five of them. There might be more of them. Here's a blessing buster. Barriers to overcome so that you can cash in on the good gift that God wants to give through to, into your life in a small group. Number one, I don't know that much about the Bible. I sometimes hear people say, oh, you know, a small group, it's a group of people, and I'm, uh, people will find out, I don't know that much about the Bible, I'll be embarrassed, and you know what? Step over that, because the best place to learn about the Bible is in a small group. It's not just one talking head talking about the Bible, it's about people sharing and learning, and here's what you'll learn. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. If you can read and discuss, you can learn from the Bible itself and you can learn from others. And the questions that you have, other people have had, and maybe they've learned some things and can share that. And they're not Bible scholars anyway. And even the small group facilitator, they're not the Bible expert. None of us need to be Bible scholars. We're just learning and growing together. And I, I say that because I've, I've shared with you my... Uh, my initial experience in small group was when I was a young adult, 20s, years before I went to seminary, years before I went to a pastor. So I experienced these things before I became a pastor. Some of you say, yeah, of course he's going to push small groups because he's the pastor of the church and there's the program. No, I experienced the realities of these good gifts in my life long, years before I even went to seminary. And I learned that I, I learned things from people in my small group that weren't pastors that they had learned some things from the scriptures and we discussed together and, and we grew together in that environment of, of learning and studying the scriptures together. And they ministered to me and, and I learned to share some things with them. And so don't let that be a blessing buster. Be a part of a small group that's learning and growing together. And you have the gift of the indwelling spirit and he is our ultimate teacher and you will learn about So don't say, well, I don't know my about the Bible, that will be a rich, growing, learning experience. Number two blessing buster that keeps some people from cashing the gift cards that God wants to deposit in their life. I don't feel comfortable praying out loud. From your background, you, you may not be comfortable. You know what? You don't have to pray out loud. <laughs> what we do is develop a safe environment where people just feel comfortable learning, growing, and if, if you're not wanting to pray out loud, you don't have to pray out Nobody's going to put you on the spot. And if you just want to pray silently and talk to God during the prayer time silently, that is totally cool. And uh, you don't need to fear putting on some kind of religious performance that you're not uh, feeling comfortable with. It's just a safe place to learn and be together and to grow. So don't let that be a blessing buster. You can just pray silently. And we always do that with our prayer time. Hey, someone feels led to pray out loud, great. If you want to just pray in your spirit to God, he's going to see your heart. He's going to hear your thoughts. And uh, don't let that be... Uh, something that would keep you apart from 
the rich benefits that God wants to bring into your life. Number three, here's a blessing buster. I don't feel comfortable with people I don't know. You mean I have to get in a room with people that I've never met before and, and share my life? And Well, here's the thing. I understand. I'm, I'm not uh, an extrovert myself. Uh, but I've learned the blessing of meeting new people. And I'm going to share with you in a few minutes. God has enriched Martha and my life so much through friends that we've made, through relationships we've developed. And small, it would have never happened if I would have said, well, you know, I'm just not comfortable meeting new people. And, and, and if that's you, that's okay. And, and, and I think you know that when groups meet, that relationships develop and they take time and nobody makes you share things you don't want to share. It's as you gain confidence and trust and, and relationship with people that you can open your lives as much as you would like or not. It's a safe place relationally to be. And um, if you're a little hesitant about meeting new people, I would say this without a doubt. There are some good gifts God wants to give into your life through other people that you haven't met yet, that you'll never receive if you don't get over that barrier and say, you know what? I'll be willing to meet some new people. God will give you some friendships that, that uh, will bring his blessing into your life. I will guarantee it because that's how he's designed the church to be. All right? Don't let that be a blessing buster. Here's another one. I'm too busy. <laughs> I'm too busy for a small group. Can I just challenge your thinking upon that? We're all busy. But a small group is designed to be an hour and a half. We use the time well. You can have a meaningful, good small group experience. And if it goes two hours, nobody's going to get bent out of shape. But we plan them for an hour and a half, and that's an effect. You have an hour and a half in your week for God's purpose in your life. None of us are... Too busy not to be able to carve out an hour and a half. If you're the exception, then come and talk to me afterwards. Prove me wrong. But I don't think anybody's too busy. Really what it comes down to, and we have some very busy people in our church, what it comes down to is your priorities, what you really value. Um, because we all do, whether we're conscious of it or not, we do what we really think is important. And if you really are convicted from the scriptures and the spirit of God that these deep and meaningful relationships are a powerful part of God's purpose in your life, you will find a way to carve out. And if it's new to you, I'd say just test drive it. <laughs> Sign up for a small group. Allow the Holy Spirit a chance to do a work in your life through this. And um, I believe you will be hooked, if you will. And I, I, I mean that in the positive sense. I, I stumbled upon the small group experience I've shared with you when I was 22, 23 years old. The church I was in at the time, I was a young adult. They totally changed, they had never done small groups before and they said we're going to try this thing called small groups and they assigned people in different areas to get in. I was assigned so me and my roommate we went and I had a powerful experience of God's work in my life through that initial small group and I have been in a small group ever since, ever since my early 20s because I've, I've tasted and I've seen and I've cashed those gift cards and it is a good work of God that I want to encourage you. If you've never been in a small group, I would say to you this that God has some great gifts that he's wanting to unwrap in your life. If you will take the steps to get over these blessing busters. But part of that might be to say, I'm going to make this a priority. And can I just say this? This is another part of the environment we set with small groups. If you miss a week, if you miss two weeks, it's not the end of the world. The sky will not fall in. You won't lose your relationship with Jesus. You know, Life happens. You might be ill. You might have a real bad... If you miss a week, it's okay. In fact, your family, church family in that small group will be there to pray for you, to, to support you, to, to help you. And nobody's going to say, hey, why weren't you at small group? You know, it was going to be, hey, how can we support you? How can we pray for you? And I always say to people, if you can't make every week, just make the weeks you can because you'll benefit from the weeks you can. So don't let that be a blessing buster. Some people, well, I can't make every week, so I'm not even going to go. Well, that's, can I say kindly... Dumb. It's like uh, cash in the gift cards that God has for you on, and according to your availability, according to the time that you can give and uh, receive some of the benefits. And I believe that as you experience that, you'll make, want to grow more and more to be involved with a small group. So I don't believe, and I stand to be corrected on this, uh, I don't believe any of us are too busy. And uh, I believe that God wants to bring good gifts into your life through deep and meaningful ministry and relationships and, and care in, a, in the body of Christ and the family of God in small groups. So that's why we're encouraging it. One final blessing buster. I don't need a small group. Once in a while, I've, you know, ah, I've got Jesus and um, I got the church on Sunday morning. I don't really need a small group. 
I would challenge your thinking on that, encourage you to, to realize that there are depths of ministry beyond what can happen Sunday morning. And obviously Sunday morning is important. The church gathers together as one family. Spiritual gifts happen. People serve one another. Jesus is praised and recognized in the community. All of that's good. But there are levels of ministry that God wants to do in your life that can't happen on a Sunday morning. And we'll look at those in a minute. So um, there's more to all that God wants to do in your life and through your life than your personal relationship with him. He's created you to be family. And he desires you to experience those relationships and care and ministry at deeper levels than, frankly, what we can do on a Sunday morning. And we'll see some reasons for that. Those are some blessing busters. Those are some barriers that for some of us we need to overcome if we're going to experience the good gifts that God wants to unwrap in our lives. What are those good gifts? Many of them, but let me share five. Five things that God wants to do in your life, particularly, especially, more strongly, through a small group ministry. And that's why we're encouraging all of us to be involved in one. Five um, good gifts that God wants to give to you in a small group. Here's the first one encouragement. Encouragement is a wonderful thing. Holy Spirit says this in Hebrews chapter 10. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together. And in the New Testament context, yes, that meant in, in large corporate settings at times, but most often it was smaller groups meeting in homes. Smaller groups meeting in homes. And he says, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Habit, it's a regular part of your life. As some are doing, instead, let us encourage one another. Because, you see, when you get together in a home, in a small group environment, encouragement, strengthening, reinforcing of your faith happens. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you needed some encouragement this last week? You can be honest. Oh, just two of us. Oh, a bunch of us. Thank you for being real. Every week I need encouragement. I'm going to need some encouragement this next week. Why? Because life isn't always easy. There's stresses, there's pressures, there's responsibilities, there's stuff happens. And quite frankly, I don't know the stresses and the pressures and the stuff that you were going through. And many of you don't have any idea of what stresses and pressures and stuff that I and Martha and our family are going through. Because we don't come on Sunday morning and then take all day to say, okay, everybody share the, the stuff you're going through. We, that just isn't practical for a Sunday morning. Do we care for each other? Yes. But obviously, in a small group of people where you, have, you know them and have developed trust and confidence and confidentiality, you can share your lives as you feel open. And it is a wonderfully encouraging thing to know, to go through the week. And we're not designed to follow Jesus all by ourselves, folks. And if you're feeling like it's just me and Jesus and I'm following him, then I would encourage you to recognize he's called us to follow him together as family in deep, committed, caring relationships for each other. And it's a wonderful thing to know that if I'm going through a real stress or pressure or difficulty or temptation or a hassle in life, whatever, I've got family around me to support me, to encourage me, to pray for me, to get, share God's word with me. I need that. And you say, you're the pastor, you need that? I'm a member of the body of Christ. We all need that. The only thing about being a pastor is our jobs are to help equip you to do what God has called you to do. And that means being involved in a small group and caring for one another and ministering to each other and praying for each other. And I think one of God's good gifts these days is a cell phone. <laughs> Because, you know what, even though our group hasn't been meeting over the summer, we've been kind of on a summer break with folks out of town and everything like that. I was on the mainland and I was getting texts from small group members saying, would you pray for this? This just came up and this is going on. And people are caring for each other and I know what's going on in their lives just through a cell phone. But you didn't know about that because you're not in that small group. I don't know what's going on in people's lives, in, but you see the value of a small group. People actually know and are known and care and support and a huge encouragement comes from that and let me share with you again I've shared this on past occasions because this might help you get over a hump you may feel like I have felt many times before you come home it's the end of a day you're physically tired and all you want to do at night is just chill have a break put your feet up rest many days I feel that way and then it's oh it's small group night I have to go out I don't want to go out after supper and if you fight that and you realize, but God wants to encourage me, <laughs> without a doubt, there's been so many times that happens where my feelings are fatigue, don't want to go, want to just chill. 
But when I say, you know what, this is what God has called me to, and I actually go to the small group, every time I come out energized, every time I come out encouraged, every time, and I say, I'm so glad I went. I'm so glad I went. I honestly have had, not had an experience. Gee, what a waste of time it was tonight. No, it's always a blessing because God wants to encourage one another. That's how he's designed relationships and ministry in the body of Christ. He will encourage you. <laughs> and one of the sad things that happens is when people, I see this often, when people go through a stress, when they go through a difficulty, when they go through a hard time, under that stress, they just back off. Haven't seen them for a while. Where are they? Well, they're, they're out there somewhere, but they back off relationships. That's where you need to press in on relationships. That's where you need the strength. That's where you need the encouragement. That's where you need people coming along and supporting you. We all do. And uh, small groups is the best place for that to happen. So that's one of the reasons. God will give you the good gift of encouragement. I have no doubt you're not that much different than me. This week, something's going to happen, and you're going to need encouragement. And who's going to give it to you? Well, one of the choice places, maybe you have family that care, maybe you have some friends who care, but there's, there's nothing like having a group of people that you were walking, following Jesus together and, and encouraging one another. It's a huge gift from God. Number two, good gift God wants to give you through small groups, love. Don't emphasize, and we looked last week, that, that the DNA of Jesus' new community, a new command I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, that you have this self-giving love that cares for one another, the best way that that, yeah, it happens wonderfully in Sunday morning and as a church family, but the, the most powerful way that happens is in a small group because that's when people actually know the needs in your life as you feel free to share them, as you are authentic and real and, and face life issues. None of us come Sunday morning to spill everything that's going on in our life, but in a small group where you have authentic, meaningful, growing relationships, you can share that and care happens. People just look out for each other. And I could tell you stories of, of Martha and me over the years where just, you know, we went through a difficult time and it was a small group who brought a meal over. It was a small group who watched our kids so we could have a night out. It was a small group member who just reached out and cared for us in a practical way. And uh, small groups are a wonderful way to express this um, relationship of, of love and care and, and, and meeting each other's needs. And again, um, whether your group is meeting or just communicates that through, through texts or phone calls or emails, um, it's a wonderful way to care for others as you're aware of their needs and also for them to care for you. And, and caring for others is a beautiful thing. Jesus says it's better to give than to receive. Well, there are times where we all need support and help and prayer, but when we reach out and care for somebody else, we know the blessing in our own heart of sharing that, that practical care, that love for others. And through that, we see that happening in the church in Jerusalem. The world is impacted. These are Jesus followers. Look at how they love on each other. And by the way, I just put that one verse in there, Philemon. I ran across this in the Devos a couple weeks ago where it, it showed uh, just one glimpse of where this small group in a home and love was happening. Paul writes under the Holy Spirit to Philemon. He says, to our friend and fellow worker Philemon, and the, note this, the church that meets in your house. Well, that was a small church. That was a small group. Uh, there's a church meeting in this home, small group of people. And what does he talk about? He says, I've heard of the great doctrine you have. Now, doctrine's important, and I don't want to minimize that at all. But he says this, I hear of your love. I hear of your love for all of God's people and the faith you have in the Lord Jesus. Here's a small group of people meeting in a home church and they're loving on each other. And Paul hears about it. I've heard this wonderful thing about how you guys are meeting in homes and loving on each other. That would be a wonderful thing for people to hear about New Hope Kailua. You know that group of Christians, they're meeting in homes, they're really caring for each other. They're loving on each other. That's a beautiful thing. And this is part of God's purposes in our lives and it happens best in the environment of close relationships, of learning and growing together in a small group. Love, encouragement, and with that comes joy. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. How many of you could use a little bit more joy in your life? Thank you very much. I certainly could. Uh, God doesn't want you to be a sad banana follower of Jesus with all of the stuff that you're going through and uh, all of the stuff I'm going through. He wants us to be experiencing those challenges and those pressures and experiencing the joy of the Holy Spirit and the growth of the Holy Spirit in those experiences. So guess what? I will guarantee you I will guarantee you, if you get involved in a small group, the joy level in your life will go up. 
because you'll meet with others who um, will encourage you and strengthen you with the challenges you face and share with you about how God came through for them. And they will pray for you and that will lift your spirit. And you will have, be able to share with others how God took you through a tough stretch or how he's helping you now. And, and that will bring you joy to be able to help and care for other people. And joy will rise as the Holy Spirit works because that's, he's the joy giver. He produces joy. And I will guarantee you if you're involved in those kinds of relationships, you will experience a deeper level of joy. That's one of the good gifts the Holy Spirit wants to give you. And it happens beautifully in small groups. Number four, encouragement, love, joy, and let's not minimize this, friendships. Friendships. Now, I like to consider myself a very young man. I'm not that, as young as I used to be, but I've learned this. The longer I go in life, I've realized that life is all about relationships. I hope you've learned that. You can have anything else, but if you don't have relationships, you've got nothing. Life is about relationships. And God wants to build into your life deep and meaningful friendship and, and relationships that, that encourage you, that strengthen you, that build you. And, and you, it's always mutual, caring, building, ministering into other people's lives. That's what family is all about. And that's why, you know, uh, Acts 2, the church is described as they were like family to each other. This, this new group of people that God had brought together through faith in Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit... They were family. They were family. They knew each other. They cared for each other. They had deep, meaningful relationships. And what this means in my own life, I told you, in my 20s, I was in that small group in Calgary. I can tell you the names of the people in that group. And a few years ago, I had the chance to go back to that church, and I was walking, and it's a, a large church. I was walking through, and it had been years since I'd been in the church, so apart from my family members, I didn't expect. And there was Thelma. <laughs> Thelma was like 50 years old when I was 20. So when I saw her, I think she was in her 70s or 80s. But I knew her name and it was like family. She came running over and she hugged me and, and there, was a, there was a friendship, there was a family relationship there with, with Thelma. And I could tell you about Dennis and Olive. They were like the, uh, the middle-aged small group facilitators in that small, f they're now living in, in, in another city. But if I was traveling to that city, all of these years later, what? 40 years later, I could phone him up and say, hey, Dennis, I'm going to be in town. Hey, let's get together. Why? Because there's a friendship. There's a bond in Jesus that happened in that time of small groups. That was all those years ago in, in, in Calgary. Uh, then I went to Dallas and graduate school and, and met and married Martha, and we were in a small group, and we've got lifelong friends. We, we haven't seen them for years because we, we don't get back to Dallas. But Chuck and Becky and, and, and Gary and Francis, those are, like, if we saw them this afternoon, it's like, you know, those kind of relationships where you haven't even been apart. There's a bond, there's a friendship, there's a family bond in Jesus that, that goes a life, lifelong. And um, all of that happened in small groups. And that was before I was a pastor. Then we moved and pastored in Victoria. We have lifelong, deep, meaningful relationship with Dave and Robin and, and, and John and Sherilyn and, and Bill and Lynn. And where did we get to know these people? It wasn't just that they were in our church. Other people were in our church. We were in small groups with them. They really got to know us. We got to know them. And, and deep friendships and meaningful relationships that last a lifetime, that last an eternity. And this is the nature of, of small groups. They bring us into a deeper relational level. And yes, I could say the same thing here. When we moved to Hawaii and, and, and New Hope Kailua, the people that really know Martha and me and the people that Martha and I really know, it's because we've been together in small groups and we're part of the family of God as well. And some of those folks have now moved to the mainland. But you know what? The bonds of friendship are deep and meaningful. And so we just prayed for uh, Paul and Annika a few weeks ago and sent them off to the mainland as they moved to California. And some of us got a text some of us that were in the small group with, with, with uh, Paul got a text, hey, they've landed, they've found a church, they're doing great, and, and that's wonderful because we're, that friendship continues even when they're on the mainland. But that happened through a small group. So these deep and meaningful friendships and relationships, not just because you're in a, a larger church together, but because you're in a small group that meets together and prays together and shares their lives together and learns together and grows together, and friendships, relationships, that's what life is all about. That, those are the beautiful gifts. Those are the good gifts that God wants to give to you. Another one, and uh, I've already mentioned it. These are the, uh, the good gifts God wants to give into your lives. Encouragement, love, joy, 
friendships, and the last one, don't minimize, growth, spiritual growth. And look at this passage in in Ephesians 4 that just nails it. God makes the whole body, the church, fit together perfectly. What he's In the context, he's talking about all of the diversity of the spiritual gifts. And he makes it fit perfectly uh, as each part does its own special work. As each part does its own special work, he's created you uniquely. He's given you a unique combination of spiritual gifts. And yes, he's placed you in the larger body, but those spiritual gifts operate most powerfully. Yes, they operate on Sunday morning. And we're blessed by that with a multitude of gifts that happens as people come to serve Jesus on a Sunday morning. But they happen very powerfully in a small group. As each part does its own special gift so that the whole body is what? It's healthy and it's growing. There's spiritual growth. New people are being reached by the Lord, but people within the group are growing spiritually into the image of Christ. And he says this, healthy and growing and full of love. Because DNA is the love, a new commandment, that you love, that you care for each other. And that happened, all of this happens most powerfully, best, in a small group environment. And as I've thought about it, why is a small group environment so powerful for spiritual growth? I'm absolutely convinced that you will never grow to be the follower of Jesus that God has placed, called you to be. You'll never grow fully unless you're involved in those deep, meaningful, authentic caring relationships. That's how he's designed the church. That's what this passage is talking about. And it operates this way for two reasons. Number one, at least two reasons. Uh, Number one is because spiritual gifts operate most powerfully in a smaller group environment where it isn't just one guy using his spiritual gifts and everybody else using their spiritual gifts of listening. Uh, But people are caring for each other. And God gives words of wisdom and words of knowledge and words of encouragement and, and, and uh, words of and, and healing and prayer. And this last uh, cycle of small groups, in our small group, we saw a physical healing. We saw a marriage healed. And that happens in small groups where people care for each other and support each other and pray for each other. And there's, a, there's an operation of spiritual gifts in small groups that it's powerful. And God has given you spiritual gifts. Now, you might say, I don't even know what those are. Guess what? My first small group experience when I was in my 20s, if you would have asked me, Rick, what are your spiritual gifts? I would have said, I don't know. I used to be pretty good at playing football. Oh, that's not a spiritual gift. Uh, But there were things there that that had not been released in my life that started to operate when I was involved in a small group. Other people saw them. Other people encouraged them. Other people said, Rick, you really should be doing this. And and got me involved in stuff I would have never thought of because my spiritual gifts started operating, even though I didn't know what they were. And um, so I want to encourage you, if you've never been in a small group and if you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, you've got a step to take where God is going to deposit some very good gifts in your life. And uh, that dimension will grow. It's the operation of spiritual gifts. And yes, this is the way he's designed the body because if you've thought to date, well, the pastor's they're the ministers, their job is to do the ministry, then you need to come back, we all need to come back to Ephesians 4. No, we're all ministers of Jesus. And the pastor's job is to help you be a minister of Jesus, and being involved in a small group is a powerful way to do that. Because there are gifts of, all of those gifts operating within the body of Christ, and even just the gift of caring. Obviously, a couple of pastors can't care for all the needs of even a church our size, but when people get involved in small groups caring for each other, that love happens in such powerful ways. And uh, that's our job to equip and enable and encourage you to be a part of that dynamic of those deep, meaningful, ministering, caring relationships in the body of Jesus. So the operation of spiritual gifts leads to growth because you will never grow as a follower of Jesus until you start operating in the spiritual gifts God has given you. And as a follower of Jesus, you have them, whether you know what they are or not. And so as you operate in your spiritual gifts, you, that was a huge growing experience for me to be in that first small group because, as I said, I started learning and serving with my spiritual gifts, and I, I grew huge during those years um, because I was operating in my spiritual gifts. And with that, great joy because when you... When the Holy Spirit gives you gifts and you release those gifts to others, guess what? He pours joy into your life and blessing into other people. That's how he's designed the church. So the operation of spiritual gifts. Here's another thing that I've learned is why small groups are such a a huge spiritual growth environment. 
application of God's word. Over and over again, Jesus, the the Bible says, you grow when you apply God's word, when you actually obey God's word, when you do God's word. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, it's the wise person who builds their life on practicing my word. You've got to put it into practice. It's much more than coming on Sunday morning and, and, um, and hearing a message saying, yeah, that's a, that's a good message and that's true, and then walking out and forgetting everything that was said. Now, <laughs> this is one of the pastor's most depressing statistics. Studies have shown that when people hear a message... They, they forget 95% of what they heard. That's really encouraging to us pastors. I'm going to work hard at my sermon prep. They're going to forget 95% of it anyway. <laughs> well, I haven't given up on the fact that the Holy Spirit will use teaching, and, and he's used it in my life, and, and, and encouraging and teaching is a part of that. But the, here's the point. Small groups take it way beyond listening to a message and maybe forgetting to what was heard when the pressures of this afternoon set in. Small groups get to a regular group of people encouraging each other to what? To live out God's truth. To apply, and that's where the growth happens. That's where the blessing happens. Jesus says, you will be blessed not by knowing the word of God, but by doing the word of God. It's application. It's actually living out the truths that you and I know. And that's what small groups do. You get together and say, hey, we're going to study this passage. We're going to hear in this next series, you know, uh, Pastor Francis Chan uh, give a, a short teaching, and then we're going to learn. We're going to talk about how we can apply this in each other's lives. And then, how did it go last week? How can I pray for you? And and what struggles did you face? And and how are we growing in this aspect of following? Jesus? It's applicational. It's encouraging us to actually live it out. And when we live it out, that's when the growth happens, and that's when the blessing happens. And that's one reason why. Small groups are so powerful. For all of these reasons, God wants you to grow spiritually to be more like Jesus. He is populating his future eternity with people who look like Jesus here and now. He's made it right between us and God, and he's making it right through our lives to the world around us, to the lives of others. But he wants us to enter into these relationships where his spirit can move in deeper ways, and and he can build the reality of Christ in us here and now, and continue his work of making things right in our lives and in the world. That's his new creation community. But it happens through deep, meaningful, caring relationships. And that's why we are emphasizing small groups leading up to September. Next week's church Ohana camp, half of our church is going to be up at camp, half of our church is going to be here, and that's totally cool. The week after that is kickoff, (laughs) if I can use the football analogy. The week after that, we'll start meeting in small groups. So the takeaway from this morning, can I challenge you wherever you're at in your journey of following Jesus? You're not called to follow Jesus alone. Jesus himself modeled a small group when he rose from the dead. There are basically 11 guys on his team. (laughs) And that grew, but it grew to a larger group that met in small groups. And uh, much of the ministry powerful ministry happens in small groups. So two things I would challenge you to do this morning, encourage you, urge you, exhort you to do. It's there in your notes. Number one, host or facilitate a small group. There's a form in your bulletin. What do you mean to host a small group? Just open your home. Do you know what's happened with this cycle of small groups? We actually have more leaders than we have homes. We have a couple leaders who say, I'll facilitate. When I say leader, that's what the facilitator's job is, is just to lead the discussion. Not to have all the answers, but to help that process of people learning and growing together. Facilitate it. We have more folks willing to do that than we have homes to operate in. So if you just would be willing to open your home, we we would be able to say, hey, here's an opportunity for another group. Our goal is to create as many groups as we can so that as many people can be involved as possible. So you might just be willing to serve as a host, or you might be willing to serve as a facilitator if the Holy Spirit gets and say, "I, I can do that. I can just help guide the discussion. We've said in the past that all you need is, you know, plug and play. Plug in the video of Pastor Francis Chan doing a 10, 12-minute teaching, and then you have the discussion questions. Lead the discussion. What does the text say? Learn from each other. Uh, You don't have to have all the answers. One of the best responses, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll call someone who may know or, or do some research and get back to you. But learning and growing together. You don't have to be the expert, even to facilitate. Some of us, I hope the Holy Spirit will be tugging on your heart to host to facilitate, just use that form, give it to me or Pastor Mark or an usher or somebody and, and we'll follow through and, and try and get as many groups 
If that's what the Lord would be leading you to, we'd love that. And by the way, we've mentioned one form of a small group is just for you to gather a group of friends, people you work with, neighbors. They don't have to be members of our church. We just want to share that blessing in many ways as we can. And you may not want to put your bulletin, your group in the bulletin because you've already got a group that's connected with it. And that's totally fine too. We've got some groups that operate that way where we've got a facilitator, some family members or friends or people at work. And um, we just want to know so we can support, pray for, get you the materials. And, and that's part of it as well. The other thing you can do, all of us can do, as you've been encouraged to do already this morning, just look at the number of groups that are there and say, that's a group I can be involved with. That's a group I connect with, age group, night, location, whatever works for you. We just want to encourage as many groups. So if, just uh, think about, pray about, sign up on the, what's the sign up for? It's just letting us know and letting the leader know who's coming. And um, it may be an opportunity for you to meet some wonderful new folks that God wants to bless your life with, but you'll never meet them if you don't sign up and, and get to know some other folks. That's been part of Martha and my journey. Let uh, learn and, and grow in relationships and meet some fo new folks that we would have never met had it not been for that small group. All of these will be ways for God to cash in some gift cards that he's already placed in your wallet, I believe. There are some good gifts he wants all of us to receive. But we've got to take the steps to enter into that, to experience the good gifts that he wants for us. So we're going to conclude this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand and let's pray together. My prayer for myself, for Martha and me in this next season is that we experience even a deeper level of what God wants to do in our lives and through our lives, through small groups, through meaningful, authentic relationships, caring for each other, learning, growing, encouraging one another. Because... Um, He's a good God, and he delights to give you and me good gifts. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. We thank you ultimately for your heart of love that created the family, that created the church to be a family, that has designed our relationships here and now representing Jesus and being a foretaste of that day when you're going to make the whole universe right, the new creation, that that is happening right now in our lives and in our church and particularly in our relationships as we minister one to another and take that blessing to the world as well. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would encourage each one of us to take that next step on the journey where we're at, on the road, on the pathway, that we would experience a fuller measure of the good gifts that you want to deposit in our lives. We love you. We thank you for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Go and have a great week. Sign up for a small group.